Over the last 150 years, God has been raising up voices prophetically and dynamically within the body of Christ to prepare the church for the return of the Lord. And if there's ever been a time to where we as the church of the living God need to have prayer and the power of the Holy Ghost as a preeminent point in our organization, within our church body, within our services, and within our very lives, it is today. So today I will begin a new series entitled The Promise of of the Spirit. And for the next eight weeks, I'm going to exhaustively, alongside Pastor Beck, working with me, teaching on Wednesdays and Sundays as well, as we plow through our subject topic and our emphasis for the next two months, the promise of the Spirit. Today's message will be the first of many as we develop our series with an emphasis on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Church family, the Holy Ghost is not the crazy uncle that we only bring out at Christmas and Thanksgiving. The Holy Ghost is important. Say that with me, the Holy Ghost is important. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit has been highly contested and, and is probably one of the most arguable arenas of theology and more specifically, within the confines of pneumatology. Pneumatology is just a big word that means the study of the spirit, the pneuma, the breath of God, the study of the pneuma. And I can assure you that all of us need some study on the pneuma, on the breath of God, on the voice of God, on the spirit of God. So preaching through this series, we're gonna be preaching all the way to Pentecost Sunday. And I've had some ask me, well, why are you doing that? Because on Pentecost Sunday weekend, we're going to have a spiritual emphasis weekend to where Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night of that weekend, we're going to have three services back to back with one focus, to see people filled with the glorious baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Yes, I'm one of those Pentecostal preachers that believes in the initial physical evidence. And over the next eight weeks, it is my intent for myself, along with the preaching staff of this church, to not only teach you about the Holy Ghost, but to be able to explain to you biblically why we doctrinally view things specifically and strategically the way that we do. We are not crazy. But I will say this, that weirdness and fruitiness is not a sign of the Holy Ghost. Jesus was not weird. Neither were any of his disciples. But just as the Bible says that it records an instance to where Jesus is teaching in a synagogue and it says that and Jesus takes the word and he begins to expound and he begins to teach from the verses and the Bible says that these people marveled at this man's teaching for he taught as one who had authority. He had authority because the Holy Ghost anointing was on his preaching. And in a day and age to where we have a lot of great orators and a lot of great speakers and a lot of great communicators, for whatever reason, that has become a, a fad term within our modern day church. Oh, well, they're a great communicator. I don't want to be a great communicator. I want to preach the word and see it followed with signs. My goal is to not entertain. My goal is to educate, disciple, and develop you so that you can be more effective in this kingdom call. Too far many Christians settle for the view of, well, I need the blood of Jesus because I want to make it to heaven. Yes, the, the blood of Jesus gets you to heaven, but it is the baptism in the Holy Spirit that allows you to bring heaven back to earth. I know that one day that I'm going to die. Guess what? All of you will too. 
But my goal in my life, so long as there is breath in my lungs, I don't want to just settle at just being saved enough to make it to heaven. I don't want to just settle to, to be just saved enough so that I can get out of hell. I want to be filled enough. So whenever people look at my life and look at my marriage and look at my children and look at my ministry, not my title and not this pulpit, whenever they see an authenticity to this man that's standing in front of you and they say, surely there is a power, there is an authority in that man's life and I can point them back and say, I would not be who I am had it not been for the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Too many of our churches are powerless, not because we're not preaching the word, but because the spirit is not there. And as an assembly of God church, we hold fast to our Pentecostal expression. Hear me clearly. So long as I am the the pastor of this church, our doctrinal stances on the 16 fundamental truths as an assembly of God church will not change, shall not change, and shall never change because I still believe in the baptism in the Holy Ghost and the manifestation of spiritual gifts based upon the teachings of the New Testament. You have to understand it's not just the teachings, it's the stories as well. As Also inclusive to that, it is the doctrines that were taught by the apostles. For 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ has based itself fundamentally on the book that we call the Bible. And last I checked, Jesus and the apostles were the authority that established the church. Who do any of us think that we are? I don't care how much schooling that someone has or how much alphabet follows their name. There is nobody, and you hear me clearly today, there is nobody on planet earth that has the authority to question what the Bible teaches. Period. But in our holding fast to all of this, it is my utmost desire and my hope that we can be authentic in our Pentecostal expressions and not strange. Weirdness is not a moniker of the anointing. There is no such gifting as the anointing of Jack Sparrow. Oh, I feel God speaking to me. Really now? Interesting. We're going to talk more about that. But not only do I want and desire for there to be authentic Pentecostal expressions, but we're going to hold fast to our doctrinal stances, period. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the White House says or the Supreme Court system says, or the ACLU, or anybody else. If we are living and teaching what the Bible says, the Bible is right and they are wrong. Jesus declared this in the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, and they'll put these verses upon the screen. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Pause. There are far too many of us as Pentecostals that are more consumed with the rapture than we are with living right. We have this philosophic view of the rapture as being escapism. Whenever the Bible says that we should occupy until he returns. Notice that their focus, their view was, when are you going to come and get this over with? He says, it's not up to you to know times and seasons that the Father has established. But what does he say? But you will receive power. When the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and notice, you will be my witnesses, not my fruits, flakes, and nuts. Too many Pentecostal movements have turned into the Kellogg's people. 
We're loud and crunchy, but we have no value. We taste good, but we don't feel very well. Am I in the word? And you will be my witnesses, not my prophets. We are so consumed with titles in this day and age that we are more focused on our titles than we are on our character. Do we not understand? I'm just going to slow down and just teach. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wind up getting off my notes today, and that's all right. The gifts of the Spirit are only made palatable, palatable, when the fruit of the Spirit in your life is not rotten. We expect people to just swing wide, oh ye gates, and make room for the great anointed one. Because we are so consumed with title and prestige and position and door placards, then we have lost focus on the fact that it is the fruit of our lives that opens the door for the gifts of our lives to be made manifest. We want to speak in tongues, but we have no patience. I can prove it to you. Because I can, I can bet my paycheck that at least one of y'all in the last 30 days have come in this sanctuary, lifted up your hands, shouted and spoke in tongues and shouted, yes, preacher, come on, pastor, hallelujah and amen, and then left here and had zero patience with your waitress. I've had business owners tell me that their waiters and waitresses hate to come to work on Sundays because the way that Christians treat them. We want to be a witness in church and iparanda ba 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 ba. We want a witness in here, but we see no value in being a witness out there. We're all about our gifts and our titles and, you know, and, and so where'd you get them alligator shoes from and can I get in contact with your tailor? And we are more concerned with our income and our intellect and all of these other things. But Jesus is saying that you're going to receive the Holy Ghost not to set your tail on a church pew on Sunday and listen to some preacher ramble for half an hour and then leave and go, well, praise the Lord, I went to church today. Can I just talk about it for just a little while? Jesus said <clears throat> that you will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. And when he had said these things, they were taken up and he left it up and the cloud took him out of their sight. So with these words in mind, why is the Holy Spirit, excuse me, when I get to heaven, I'm asking Jesus two questions. What is the point of sinuses and pollen and what is the point of gnats and mosquitoes? <clears throat> <clears throat> I've been popping Zyrtec like Skittles and it's still getting me. With, with these words of Christ in mind, why is the Holy Spirit such an important piece of the puzzle regarding the emphasis that Christ placed upon the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit and the need for the empowerment of his consubstantial spirit? It's simply this. The Apostle John, I'm jumping forward in my notes for my media team, page four. The Apostle John in the book of the Revelation notes this in Revelation 12 and 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now, shout now. You know what it means in the Greek? Now. Now, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. Whose authority? The authority of who? Now, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of what? of his Christ, not from you. Jesus does not need your approval to move. Last I checked, he's God all by himself. 
If he's the alpha and the omega, the, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, then who do any of us think that, that we have a, a position or a power of authority to tell Jesus what he can and cannot do in his church? Well, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit outpours like that to where people manifest gifts anymore. Well, last I checked, Jesus was the one that said that these signs shall follow those who believe. So if I've got to depend on your opinion or on his word, I'm going to depend on his word. Come on, Pastor Brad. And if we're truly a part of his kingdom and we intend to seek the kingdom as Christ instructed us to do, then we must make the Holy Spirit a priority again in our Christian development and in our di discipleship and in our demonstration of the fruits, shout fruits, and gifts. See, we love gifts because gifts give us notoriety, but fruit gets on our nerves. You can pray, Brad Frost, you can pray and ask God, give me the, the, the gift of prophecy, and the Lord can give you that. But the moment that you pray, give me patience, all hell breaks loose in your life. And, it's, and it's, it, it's all of a sudden a miracle. Every idiot in Washita Parish all of a sudden surrounds you on every side. <laughs> See, we love gifts because it postures us, but our fruit breaks us. Our fruit breaks us. Our fruit is painful. Gifts give us joy. Fruit gives us burden. We would much rather speak in tongues and prophesy and then turn around and try to lay hands on somebody than we would have a pastor tell us that if you speak in the tongues of men and of angels but you have not love in your heart, you're nothing. It's all right. Today's going to be like the sham wow commercial. Just wait, there's more. We believe, the assembly, West Monroe, we believe in a greater work of grace, which is the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And it's high time, God help us, that spirit-filled churches, at least by name only, start making the, the move and the empowerment of the Holy Ghost a priority in their services again. If Jesus died to build his church and then he turns around and tells his disciples that they're not allowed to go and expand his church until they receive the Holy Ghost, then have we lost our mind to think that we can build his house without his spirit? Last I checked, on, even to take that a little bit further, Jesus said that I shall build my house, that I shall build my church. Not you, not Pastor Christopher. We are all a part of his plan. But if he doesn't build his house, according to the book of Proverbs, they who labor are laboring in vain. And what we're building is empty. Don't you find it interesting that in 2020, that all of these pastors and religious leaders who had these preeminent positions all of a sudden started being uncovered? We run around with our revival talk and how we want God to move and, and revival is coming and God's going to build his church and there's going to be another great outpouring and we just get so excited in all of that because we think that revival is a magic pill that's all of a sudden going to manifest and miraculously all of our issues are going to go away. Have you read your Bible? Revival had hit Rome. Revival had hit Corinth. And Paul is still having to correct people in leadership. I'll give you an example. A church in revival. Again, context. God is moving. Gifts are everywhere. People are getting filled and saved and baptized. But then Paul writes in his letter, he says, what is this foolishness that I hear? That you're allowing a man 
in leadership in your church who is sleeping with his father's wife. That's in your Bible. You don't have to watch days of our lives to get drama. Just read the word. And if you're watching that mess, turn it off anyways. So you've got churches in revival. God's moving. Miracles are happening. But the spirit of stupid is still in the church. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to get Greek on it. Itiatus. Is where we get the English word idiot. Am I in the word today? So point number one, everybody breathe. They're like, pastor's mad. I'm not mad, I'm passionate. Because I'm tired of churches being Pentecostal in name only but having no power. So point number one today. The power of the Spirit is essential. The thing that infuriated everybody during the COVID outbreak and the pandemic and all of that stuff was that certain people were making decisions over who is essential and who is not. The problem is the church has been doing that for a long time. The Holy Spirit is only essential whenever things are really bad. But we don't need him so long as we're doing good. It's okay, thank you. I had, I had one say that you're right. Praise the Lord. I, somebody right here. I agree. I know I'm right. Because I see it all the time. Because many of us in this room, you've been raised around Pentecost. You were raised in this church. And the problem is, is that you're no more Pentecostal than that camera stand. Because you have a title emblazoned across your chest, but you have no fruit nor power. What is wrong with us? Last I checked, Jesus is not going to consult the role of this church on who he accepts and doesn't. He's going to look at your life, not your tithe record. The power of the Spirit is essential. And whenever the modern day believer, especially those of us who subscribe to our Pentecostal theology, whenever we look at the modern day church, it leaves us with that question from, from the 1980s commercial about a hamburger. Where's the, where's the power? I call prayer meeting on Sunday mornings at 9.30 and half of you show up, half of you don't. We start service at 10 o'clock sharp in worship and half of you show up 20 minutes late. We claim that we desire a move of God, but there's no fruit of our desire because we're on time everywhere else but going to church. And you've got time for travel ball and ballet and dance classes, and going boating, and skiing, and four-wheeling, and hunting, and everything else, but you can show up at church once a month, but then still claim to be a believer. Well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor, because you get paid to be here. Let me help you with something. I wasn't always full-time pastoring, and I wasn't always full-time in ministry, but my tail was always in church. I don't know who I would be if I had to go a month without my church. The Holy Ghost, well, pastor, you just insulted me. It's okay. The Bible says that, that you still have to love me. But if I told you the truth, get over it. <laughs> Again, where's the beef? Where's the power? Where is the demonstration? The saddening reality of this is that power doesn't manifest due to the actions of men and not on the part of God withholding his spirit. The Holy Ghost moves through you. Say the Holy Spirit. Say it with me. The Holy Ghost moves through me. Professor Richard Shaw of Princeton, and they're going to put this up on the screen. He said this. If there ever was a time whenever the world desperately needed women and men of God on fire with the power of God, motivated for and committed to the struggle for its restoration, it is now. 
For what is at stake at the present time is not only the survival of hundreds of millions of broken and impoverished people, but the creation of the conditions for a truly human existence in society and the salvation of a planet. It is the lack of power and true passion for the kingdom of God that is the very reason why the church is impoverished and blind. Why do you think that in the book of the Revelation, Jesus is correcting a church and he says, you think that you have need of nothing. You're enriched and you're advancing and you're growing and you're doing all of these things. He said, but the problem is that you're impoverished, that you're naked and you're blind. If Jesus considered the Spirit of God as optional and not essential, then why were his last instructions to his disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait there until they be endued with power from on high? Why did he give them instructions to go and do that if the Holy Ghost was not necessary? Lord Jesus, you don't need the Holy Ghost to come to church. You need the Holy Ghost to go to Walmart. You need the Holy Ghost to raise them heathen kids. Some of y'all got them bad youngins too. Drop them off in, in kids' church and then all of a sudden it's turned into a juvenile detention office. You need the Holy Ghost to heal your marriage. You need the Holy Ghost to walk out of anxiety and depression. You need the Holy Ghost to be a Christian. Well, I just want the Holy Ghost to move. Well, how about it move in your relationships? The, the, the same Holy Ghost that... Can I just talk about it for him just for just a minute? The same Holy Ghost that harnesses your tongue to speak in tongues should be the same Holy Ghost who has the power to tell you to shut your mouth. Don't clap because half of y'all guilty. Can fresh water and salt water come out of the same cistern? Can gossip and glory come out of the same mouth? Jesus did not say that the Holy Ghost was optional. So I have two words for you. Stop it. Stop thinking that all of this extra stuff is optional. It's not extra. It's necessary. I need the Holy Ghost to pastor some of y'all. Because I don't have the gifting in and of myself to put up with some of y'all. Well, I can't believe that you just said that. Well, I didn't call out no names. But if you're feeling guilty, then, then you need to pray. But many of us, notice now, no, notice now, we want the empowerment of the Holy Ghost, but we don't want the correction of the Holy Ghost. See, some of us don't view the Holy Ghost as essential because we know that the Holy Ghost is going to tell on us. Whenever I was in high school living like the devil and doing stuff that I ought not be doing, my mama would wait up for me. And my mama could tell me where I'd been, what I had done, who I was with, and what the people were wearing. God is my witness. I swear before Christ, that is the truth. I could not even sin good. The Holy Ghost was always telling on me. And too many of us, we don't view the Holy Ghost as essential because we don't want God getting all up in our business. 
We want his empowerment because that gives us value, but we don't want his correction because God loves me and has a plan for my life. God would never correct me. Pastor, don't you know that, 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 that condemnation is not from God? We confuse condemnation with correction. Conviction is from the Holy Ghost. Condemnation is from the devil. But we think that whenever we feel bad about doing something, well, I shouldn't feel this way because th this is condemnation. No, it's not. It's the Holy Ghost telling you to get your head. My redneck almost bled through. We want the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we don't want the chastity that the Holy Spirit demands. We want the fruit of the Spirit, oh Lord Jesus, but we don't want his pruning. We don't want the Holy Ghost telling us who we should and should not be hanging around. Well, I'm supposed to influence people. Don't you know that, Pastor? The Bible says, according to the words of Jesus, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost was given to you to be a witness, not a counselor. Most people who come to you and, and confess all of their mess, they don't want you to correct them, they want you to coddle them. They want you to condone what they're doing so that they can feel okay in their sin. I love you, but as your pastor, I cannot sit back and let you feel okay whenever you're living in abject rebellion against the Word of God. This is not about re rebellion against me. Don't you know that Paul said that everything done in your body, even down to the words that come out of your mouth, that you're going to have to give an account for them? The man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament said this. He says, I dread the day to where I will have to stand before Christ and give an account for myself. If the man who wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament text is concerned about the day that he will have to give an account for himself to Christ, then Lord God have mercy. How much more so should we be concerned? Well, I'm no longer under law, pastor. I'm under grace. You need to go back and listen to my message I preached a year ago. About grace. Grace is not the absolution of the responsibility of your actions. It is the demand to live at a higher level. I ain't even going to preach that message. I'm going to move on. Is that all right? We want his presence, but, but we don't want his re responsibility. We want God to move, but we want him to move our way. And with what we like and with what speaks to us. Well, last I checked, we're not worshiping you. Is this thing on? Do I need to hold it up a little bit higher? Because last I checked, we're not worshiping you. Well, pastor's just being mean today. No, I'm not. It's called leadership. Point number two today. The purpose of the Spirit is not only essential, the purpose of the Spirit is quintessential. The truth of the matter is this, is that we must take necessary steps towards correcting our mistakes or the sobering truth of our failure will e eventually become the reality of the modern day church. We will either pay attention to the warning signs that, that are being delivered from the watchman or we're going to steam headlong into our own destruction with the warning signs arrested firmly within our fingers. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to enable us to receive instruction and wisdom and direction from the Father of lights. 
Origen, who was an early church father, declared this. The Holy Spirit himself re receives instruction. This is clear from what is said about the paraclete and the Holy Spirit. Quote, he will take of mine and declare it to you. Does he then from these instructions take in everything that the Son himself knows, gazing at the Father from the first? The Holy Ghost is quintessential. It is necessary. And the divine instruction and teachings that were promised by the Lord Jesus, notice what he said in the Gospel of St. John chapter 14 and 26. But the helper, shout it with me, the helper. And all of us need help. And the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father shall send to you in my name, if the Father makes it an imperative to send him to you, then why are you refusing to receive one of the greatest gifts that heaven has ever given? That makes no sense to me. Why are we disowning the very gift that our heavenly Father has given to the church after Jesus' ascension? Even Jesus said it this way. He says, I must needs leave from you. He said, in so that the promise of the Spirit can be sent to you. Church family, we will never fulfill our purpose in Christ apart from the Spirit of Christ. I'm going to say that again. You will never fulfill your purpose in Christ apart from the Spirit of Christ. Period. We will never ever see revival if we refuse to participate with the very entity that ushers in revival itself. We pray for revival, but we disown the very entity that has the ability to bring it. And can I just go a little deeper here? What is the term revive connotate? The resurrection of something that was dead. So are we not in all of our revival talk actually admitting to the fact that the church died on our watch? We need revival. We wouldn't have to revive something if we had made sure it stayed alive. That's good preaching, Pastor. You just keep on doing your thing. <laughs> Novation, who was noted amongst the early church fathers, declared the following. He said the, the paraclete has, was received from Christ that he may declare. But if he was received from Christ what he may declare to us, Christ is greater than the paraclete. For the paraclete would not receive from Christ unless he were less than Christ. But the very fact that, that the paraclete is less than Christ proves that Christ is God. For the testimony of Christ's divinity is immense in the paraclete being found to be less than Christ in this economy. The bottom line is that you cannot fulfill and walk out what Christ is calling you to do as an individual and as a church apart from the very power, the, the actual generator, the actual thing that creates the, the power that we're supposed to be demonstrating, you're not going to be able to do it apart from him. You are not going to fulfill your purpose in Christ apart from his spirit. Oh, Jesus. You're speaking in tongues does not replace the apology that you owe to people in English. No clapping, just, just think. Our speaking in tongues does not replace the apology that we owe to other people in English. Speaking in tongues do not relieve you of the responsibility for your actions. Your gifts do not magically make your bad decisions miraculously go away. Speaking in tongues does not mean, hear me today, Lord Jesus. Speaking in tongues does not mean that you are spiritually healthy and mature. 
Well, I can't believe that you just said that. No, 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 no. Hear me. You're speaking in tongues does not mean that you are spiritually healthy and mature because there are children in kids' church who speak in tongues today. It does not make you spiritually mature. It just means that you have a spiritual gift. Remember that even children can pray in tongues. So stop looking at your prayer language as if it is a sign that you have arrived and that you are God's first cousin because I've met devils who spoke in tongues. I've met Baptist folk who don't even believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost who were nicer than some tongue-talking people who claim to be filled with his spirit. Some of the meanest church people I've ever met have Pentecost emblazoned across their forehead. Praise the Lord. Speaking in tongues is not a barometer to try and prove your maturity in Christ. If you want to show me maturity in Christ, then, then show me ma maturity in handling conflict or protecting your church or even better yet, protecting your pastor and learning to keep your mouth shut. It's amazing to me that oftentimes conflict in our church, I am the last one to find out about it, but I am the greatest authority in this house. If you've got questions about something that is going on, quit talking to brother such and such and then sister yay yay and come talk to pastor who is actually the one at the end of the day who is the only one who has authority to fix what you're mad about. But we would much rather... Go to brother such and such and sister yay yay because we enjoy gossiping more than we enjoy peacemaking. Selah. Your mouth leaves a mess perpetually that the Holy Ghost has to mop up. Abba Hyperchius, who is marked as one of the desert fathers, in the first century church, he says this. He says, it is better to eat meat and drink wine and not eat the flesh of, of your brother through slanderous words. Again, the, the purpose of the Holy Ghost is quintessential if we intend on building a strong and healthy church. Trying to, to build a church without the Holy Ghost is like trying to build a brick wall without mortar. It might look strong, but, but whenever the winds come, it's going to fall because the very bonding agent who has the power to hold everything together is not there to be found. We are not going to build this church apart from the moving and the power of the Holy Ghost. Because last I checked, none of us died to build this thing. So who are we to think that we have authority to tell God how he's supposed to build his church? Point number three, Pastor Brad, if you'll come. Well, Pastor, I thought you were preaching on the Holy Ghost today, and this is supposed to be a good message. It is a good message. It's a great message. It's only not a good message to those who don't live right. And God help us in the day in which that we live, everybody is offended about something. A Satanist rips off a bunch of Nike shoes, and Christians lose their ever-loving mind. Y'all spent more time on Facebook rambling about a rapper who was selling Satan shoes. If I could get y'all that devoted to Christ and building his church, we just might have a revival. Well, pastor, did it bother you? Yes, it did. But how many of y'all prayed for that man? Well, he's going to hell. We were all going to hell apart from Christ. Well, I don't believe that God would send people to hell. We were already on the road to that destination. And Jesus made an off-ramp.
The apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, guys, things are going to get worse. A sign of the times towards the end. Things are going to get worse. And we're losing our mind because witchcraft is on our television and on social media. The problem is, is that your children have been reading Harry Potter for over a decade and all of a sudden now you're tripping. Well, bless God, that pastor talking about Harry Potter, he's religious. Read your Bible. Third point. The person of the Holy Spirit is the triune part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is a multifaceted being that is equipped with the ability to restore and build and empower the life and the being of the believer. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the manifestation of God in the very life of the believer. And as a person, hear me now, as a person, I am a husband, I'm a father, I'm a friend, I am a pastor, I'm a minister, I'm a brother, I'm a, and, and, and I'm all of these different things. All of these, and all of these attributes are embodied all in one person. As, and as I am a multifaceted person, so is the Lord in the same manner. He is Father, Friend, Savior, Healer, Provider, Defender, Righteous, Grace, Love, Hope, and our Deliverer. Roger Olson, the author of the book entitled The Mosaic of Christian Belief, wrote this. Unfortunately, some Christians have become so exasperated exasperated by the seeming confusion surrounding the belief in the Trinity that God is one divine being eternally existing as three distinct persons that they have functionally given up on it. I don't care where you stand doctrinally, whether you believe in the Trinity or whether you believe in, in Unitarianism, Trinitarianism versus Unitarianism. I don't care where you stand on it. We're all arguing, trying to explain a being that none of us have the mental capacity to be able to explain. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, whenever Moses was speaking to the people, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God is one. Shout one. And we love that verse. Bless God, he's one. The problem is, is that that is a Hebrew term, which means echad. Say it with me, echad. The only way to say it really good is if you have a really bad sinus infection. Echad. The word echad means complex or compound being. So Moses comes off the mountain and he tells them, he says, Hero Israel, the God that you're serving is so complex that you cannot wrap your mind around who he is. He is Echad. He is compound. He is multifaceted. He is complex. There's no way you're going to be able to wrap your mind around him on this side of eternity. The Holy Spirit is de designed to be to us as Jesus was to his disciples. And last I checked, Jesus corrected his disciples constantly. Jesus was limited in the earth being in a physical body, but at the point of his death, it was the Holy Spirit that was able to infill the lives of people. Neither the, neither the church nor the baptism of the Spirit was known until the, the death of Christ. He lives in the life of the believer and he manifests his presence through tongues and gifts and other manifestations just, just as Paul also expressed and we're going to dive deeper into this verse over the next coming weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Shout ignorant. God does not want us ignorant of himself. And I've gone over my preaching time today. I'm sorry about that. I close with this. It is the Spirit of God through education, impartation, and wisdom in the endowment of spiritual gifts that is given to, to, the, to the believer for the advancement of said person by creating not just a desire for the Word, but also for His presence and his power. People can read their Bible and be just as foolish whenever they finish reading them as they did whenever they first started. 
The baptism in the Holy Ghost is an absolute imperative in walking in the fullness of God's word in life because the believer, because of this, because how can we understand what is written if we refuse to know the one who wrote it? Again, just challenging us today. I close with this quote. The importance of the personality of the Spirit and of being assured of this fact is forcibly set forth by Dr. R.A. Torrey when he quoted this. If the Holy Spirit is a divine person and we know it not, we are robbing a divine being of the love and the adoration which are his due. It is of the highest practical importance whether the Holy Spirit is a power that we and our ignorance and weakness are somehow able to get a hold of and use or whether the Holy Spirit is a personal being who is to get hold of us and use us. It is the highest experimental importance many can testify to the blessing that came into their lives when, when they came to know the Holy Spirit not merely as a gracious influence but as an ever-present loving friend and helper. I want to close with this thought. Oftentimes the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit thereof has been taught as if it's us getting more of God. How many of y'all would say, I need more of God today? I want to turn something and I want you to think about it from a different perspective this morning. Is the infilling of the Holy Spirit really about you getting more of God or is it more about God getting more of you? I'm going to say that again. Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit really about you getting more of God or is it actually about God getting more of you? Because everything about spiritual gifts involves him getting a hold of something in your life. And isn't it unique that if we believe as we do of the doctrine of the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit being speaking in tongues, isn't it funny that the first thing that the Holy Ghost targets to get a hold of in your life is the most unruly member in your body and it lives between your teeth. If God can get a hold of our mouth, he can get a hold of our lives. If you'll stand this morning, please. Church family, the Holy Ghost is essential. Say it with me. The Holy Ghost is essential. Point number two, the Holy Ghost is quintessential. Say it with me. The Holy Ghost is quintessential. And thirdly, the Holy Ghost is a triune part of the Godhead. Say that with me. The Holy Ghost is a triune part of the Godhead. And we all desperately need his help today. I will never be the pastor, the husband, or the father that Christ is calling me to be apart from his spirit empowering me to do so. And it's not about me getting more of God so that I can do more godly things. It's about God getting a hold of me so that I can start doing things in and through him. And every one of you under the sound of my voice, including those of you that are watching by television and live stream and Facebook and every other medium that we use, every one of us are in desperate need of his help today. If you would agree with that, say amen.